and the Twitter framework Great introduced many new features and improvements, and the list of changes described on the Microsoft blog goes on and on. But don't worry, because I've already gone through this list, and today we'll discuss the most interesting new features of Entity Framework Core 8. Amongst other things, this will include support for time-only type and date-only type, this will include support for primitive collections, queries of unmapped types, lazy loading for untracked entities, and lookup of tracked entities without the need of querying the database again. I'll also mention two minor improvements for bulk updates and bulk deletes, and also a minor change for determining the length of the discriminator column when inheriting. In addition, Entity Framework 8 also introduced complex types, but I will not discuss them in this video, so make sure to subscribe to the channel because you don't want to miss that. Alright, so here in the code I have prepared a very simple demo, and just to demonstrate, this is a console application using an Entity Framework Core 8. So as you can see, we have a sample DB context, and basically it defined two entities. First of all, we have sample entity and then orders. So sample entity will be our main entity. And as you can see, here we have defined, of course, the ID, a simple name property. Then we have two daytime and time only properties, which previously have not been supported. And also in this class, we have two primitive collections, which are string array and role array. Role is nothing else but a enum defined here in our code. And then the sample entity definition also refer to the order class, which will be handled as it was previously. So this definition will just create a foreign key in the database. All right, so having this in place, let's go ahead and see the first example, which will be about the date only and time only support. So let me run this application. All right, and here we are going to query the database, and we are going to check whether the date of birth, which is a type of date only, is going to be equal to the date, which we also have defined as a date only parameter. And also, there is a second part of the query in which we are checking a alarm time, which is a time only property, is greater, and at the same time, is it and at the same time, if it's lower than the end time. So both start time and end time, they are defined here in the code. So if I execute this sample query, as you can see here in the database side, we have uh, two parameters used for the date of birth, and the type parameter is actually represented by the date type in the SQL database. And also, whenever we are querying the time, here you can see that the start type, for example, is represented as a time type on the database side. This was not previously possible. We had to use the datetime property in C Sharp, and on the database it was datetime to column type. But now using Entity Framework Rate, it is supported, and you can freely use the date only and time only types. All right, so moving on, and uh, the next example is going to be about primitive collections. So as we remember, our sample entity has two primitive collections. First one was beers, and the second one was rolls. So let's imagine that we wanted to query the sample entities so that we want to get only those for which the beer collection contains, let's say, Heineken. And if we execute this query, as you can see here on the left, Entity Framework is actually using OpenJSON because the beer collection on the database site is serialized and used as a JSON array. So using OpenJSON, you can query the beers so that the value is going to match Heineken in this simple example. In the next example, and we have a collection of lager beers, and let's say that we want to get only those entities that contain at least one of the defined lager beers. In this scenario, the query is pretty simple. We are going to just use the WHERE clause, and we are going to check whether the lager beers, which are defined as a string array collection, contains any beer from the sample entity. And once we execute this query, again here the lager beers parameter is used as a very simple JSON array. And again, Entity Framework Core will be able to use the open JSON syntax to query the beers so that we will get only those entities that at least contains one of the beers from within the collection that we passed as a parameter. Moving on to the next example, now we have defined a very simple array of two entities and we are actually able to use it against the equals operator. So this will match whether the beers property of any record in the database is equal to exactly Guinness and Budweiser. And besides that, we are going to just select the name of the entity and the beers collection using the select statement. So if we execute this one, here on the left, you can see that we have a filter on the beers where the beers is just a collection of two values as a JSON array. Besides that, the select statement is going to just get their name and also the beers collection. And this actually results in one entity that is matching the predicate. 
So the collection of beers is just Guinness and Budweiser. Moving next, here I have defined uh, two roles as an array, so admin and a user. And we can also filter the sample entities to check whether there's any of them that contains at least one of the two defined. So again, we could use the roles as a parameter and then check whether any entity in its roles column contains any of the defined roles here as an array. So if I executed this query, again, here on the left, as you can see, even though the roles collection is an array of two values, 0 and 1, represented by the enum in our case, again, it is using an open JSON format to actually filter the values and match them against our roles property defined in the sample entity. So in this way, Entity Framework Array will allow us to actually use primitive collections and underneath it will use JSON format to store the values on the database side and also to query those values it will use open JSON syntax and on our side we'll just use standard plain link. Moving on the next new feature is a SQL query for unmapped types. So previously whenever we had a query that didn't match any of our DB sets defined in the DB context we had to actually create a specific DB set for this type of uh, result and then you had to configure this DB set so that it will not be tracked by our migration schema. And now let's say that we have uh, actually two simple records that we wanted to use as a return types. So let's imagine that we have a beer stats record that is defined by a, a string array of beers. It has a count as an int and also a year as an int. And then the second type, a custom type that is going to be returned from within the SQL queries is an order DTO defined by a description as a string and date only as a date of birth property. So having those two records defined, now we can use them as the return type using the new SQL query syntax into which we are going to pass first of all the type of the return value. And then here as a parameter, we have to pass in the formatable string because this will actually allow us to interpolate any string in order to actually pass in any type of SQL parameters. So as you can see, here I have defined a simple query, selecting a beers and the year of the date of birth column, and also a count, and everything is first of all filtered by the alarm time, and the alarm time is going to be an interpolated parameter on the SQL side. So having this query defined, if I execute this simple SQL query method, and then to list async, well, if we go to the console, here on the very bottom you can see that first of all, the alarm time has been replaced by a parameter, so it's nothing else but a time specified by ourselves in the C# -sharp code and then of course we have the rest of our query that we have defined as a formatable string and as you can see as a result we have actually two entities of the type beer stats and here the only trick is that you have to actually be very careful whenever defining the query because the name of the columns that you are returning from the query have to match the properties that have been defined in our simple DTO model so beers matches the collection of beers year also matches and the count as well. So in this way, I was able to actually map the unmap type to the simple beer stats DTO. In the next example, I have a simple select statement, but here I'm also treating this as a base query, and then I'm using the where clause to actually filter the date of barrier to be less than 1990. So in this scenario, if I execute this query, here on the left, we can see that now we have a, actually a sub query, first of all, using our custom circular query. And then on top of that, we have the rest, so it's nothing else but the where statement, which checks whether the date of birth year is going to be lesser than 1919. So in this way, we are going to be able to treat this sample queries as a base of our link iQueryable definition. But also what is important, that if we want to actually use a shadow property, so let's say that even though I know that the value property exists on one of the tables on the database side, I will not be able to use them right now it is still not supported. The next example is going to show us how can we use lazy loading for untracked changes. So let's imagine that we are going to load a collection of sample entities. And let's say that for one of them, we would actually need to load the order collections. And to do that, we can now just use the collection expression into which we will have to specify which collection we want to load. And with the load async method, the orders collection will be loaded to our entity. So maybe first of all, Let's see and check whether now the order collection is actually a null or empty value, and indeed it is. But after we execute the load async expression, now the orders are defined as a collection of orders that are fetched from the database. So when the load async method was executed, actually here on the left, you can see that 
the simple simple select statement has been executed against the database with a filter on the sample entity ID as this was our foreign key to the sample entity. So in this way, now we'll be able to use lazy loading to load up the untracked entities without any additional overhead. The next example is going to show us how we can use lookup for tracked entities, so entities that we have already loaded to the dbContact instance. So let's say that we are going to clear the change tracker, and now I'm just loading sample entities with their orders to the memory of our program. And now let's imagine that somewhere else in our program, we actually needed to query again the sample entities collection to get the first of them, which name is equal to John. So by the standard way, again, querying the context and the sample entities dataset, this solution would go ahead and query the database again, getting the first sample entity for which the name is equal to John. So instead of having to query the sample entities again, we can now use the sample entities DB set and the local property. And on this local property, I can use the find entry method that will actually query by the ID. So find entry with one will actually get me the first entity with the ID equal to one. And as you can see, after this line of code, there is no SQL query. And if we look into the sample by key object and its entity property, it's actually the value that we wanted to get from the database, but it was already loaded to our change tracker into our DB context. So in this way, we will not have to actually query the database again and again, whenever there is a need of querying the values that we are already tracking. In the next example, I'm also using the find entry method, but this time I'm passing two parameters. The first parameter is defining on which column or property we are going to filter the values, and the second parameter is defining the value of the property. So by this statement, so find entry of a name and John parameters, we are going to actually find the first entity for which the name property is equal to John. So again, there is no query in the database site, and our sample entity can be used in any way in our program. And the last example is actually going to use a link query. And now instead of using the find entry on the local entity, I'm just using the first or default method from link and passing the lambda for which we are going to check the name property that is equal to John. So again, in this way, I was able to actually get the entity without the need of querying the database again. There are also two small improvements that I wanted to discuss, but maybe let's go ahead and switch to the presentation. And the first one that we are going to discuss are bulk operation improvements. So let's imagine that we have a customer entity and the customer entity has defined a own type of a customer info with a tag property. So previously, whenever we had a, this kind of a structure and we wanted to actually update the customer info dot tag property using the bulk update feature from Entity Framework Core 7, this would actually throw an error. But right now we can use this approach and the tag property of the customer info on type will be properly updated. All right, and the last improvement is going to be about the TPH, so table pair hierarchy discriminator length. So let's say that we have a base class of a document, which is an abstract class, and it defines some properties. And then we have two concrete types, which are book and also second one, a magazine. And both of them are inheriting from the document base class. So if we use those two classes in Entity Framework Core 8, now it will create a column for the discriminator, which will contain the information about the inherited type. And previously, the envelope chart column was defined to be a max value, but right now, Entity Framework Core 8 is using a simple algorithm to define how long the maximum discriminator length could be. So using the names of our entities, it will check what is the first value from the Fibonacci collection that can contain any of the names of our entities. Those were the few features that I wanted to discuss. Let me know in the comment section which one is your favorite one.